created, we call that angina, angina pectoris. The word angina comes from the Greek to throttle, to choke. The same root gives you words like anguish, anxiety, anger. So can you see the common theme of how these things can be related? And don't forget the term angina was coined in, uh, by William Heberden. And long before he related it to blood flow to the heart, we call it angina of the breast, a choking of the breast. So you get a double whammy, miss beat, pause, is it ever gonna start, boom. And quite often when it comes in, the valves aren't timed correctly, so it might whoosh up in your neck. It might whoosh up in your neck and make you feel dizzy because you've got little sensors in your arteries here called the carotid bodies, which is what the brain uses to monitor blood pressure. And if the brain sees a sudden surge of blood pressure, it may lower your blood pressure. So it makes you feel a bit like that sometimes, or can make you cough. <laughs> or can make you feel like you've gone over the roller coaster on the brow of the hill in the car too fast. How do these things kind of become a problem? Well, usually the patient is lying awake at night, lying on the left-hand side. That does two things. One, you can hear your pulse, so you can hear it become irregular. And two, your heart is on the left-hand side of the body, or the main pump chamber is, and when you're lying on your left-hand side, it brings it close to the chest wall, so you are more sensitive. Plus, you're lying in bed, so all the distractions that are usually there day to day are absent. So quite often, the patient is lying there and notices this phenomena and becomes incredibly anxious. To my mind, and this is only my kind of personal condensation for my own understanding, any kind of psychodynamic kind of therapy works essentially by somehow moving the emotion off the trigger and observing that, and then somehow reframing it or changing your thoughts about it or just being able to observe it, whether it's kind of gestalt therapy where you literally change chair and watch yourself from different sides of the room or whether it's in your head or whether it's watching that film and having control of it and making it grainy and black and white, etc. All these things are essentially doing the same things, aren't they? I always use an induction. Always use an induction. Why? Because even though I was, you know, trained as Neo Ericksonian, actually there's an awful amount of um, I'm the man, you're going to do as I say type thing in my practice. Why? Because when they come to a cardiology clinic, I am, without being too immodest, the expert. You know, this is what I do day in, day out. So I'll actually use a little bit of kind of authoritarianism with them because um, it just fits with my persona when, I'm, when I meet them. When we do placebo-controlled trials, it's not because we hate the placebo, it's because we recognise and respect its power. What we have to do is to remove it, or remove its effect, or balance its effect, more likely, in experiments. Because we know it's massively powerful, and we use it day in, day out. So please, don't let our kind of dogma sound anti-placebo, anti the use of kind of mind and suggestion and the words we use, because actually that's not what we're saying. We use it every single day.